Hey everybody, Johnny the Queer Potus here, and today we're going to take a look at our 17th president, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson is famous for being the first U.S. president to get impeached, but those who study Johnson know that he was famous for something else too, his vetoes, 29 to be exact. Until Johnson, no other president had ever come close. In this video, we'll take a look at five of President Johnson's most notorious vetoes. As always, don't forget to like this video, hit subscribe below for more presidential content, and if you'd like to support this channel, check out my Patreon site. Links in the description below. Okay, let's get started. Now, I'm guessing most of you out there don't know a heck of a lot about Andrew Johnson. So before we get to the vetoes, let's talk about who our 17th president actually was. Andrew Johnson was not elected president. Rather, he'd assumed the presidency in 1865 after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Unlike Lincoln, Johnson was a Democrat. He was a longtime public servant from Tennessee and the only Southern Senator to refuse to join the Confederacy during the Civil War. As the Union Army made progress in Tennessee, Lincoln installed him as the state's military governor. Johnson became a hero in the North, and soon he was nominated as Abraham Lincoln's vice president for his re-election campaign in 1864. In hopes of winning bipartisan support, the Lincoln-Johnson ticket ran under the banner of the National Union Party rather than the more divisive Republican Party. It was a pretty good plan. That is, if you completely leave out who Andrew Johnson was. The Republicans got an early taste of who they'd just made VP during Andrew Johnson's swearing-in ceremony. The vice president-elect was complaining of an ill feeling and tried to ameliorate his condition by taking a few swigs of whiskey. As he took his oath, Johnson appeared visibly drunk. He then stumbled his way through a meandering speech which had to be cut off part of the way through. Okay, how about that? How about that? Yeah. Yeah, what? Outside on the Capitol steps, as President Lincoln delivered his second inaugural address, the new vice president hid his face from the public. Johnson was vice president for less than two months before the assassination of Abraham Lincoln launched him into the presidency. But the office that Johnson had inherited was one unlike any president had inherited before. The emergency of the Civil War had demanded a radical expansion of the size of the federal government, as well as the powers of the presidency. When Johnson took hold of the office in 1865, no one had ever held so much power in U.S. history. Johnson would oversee the post-war reconstruction period, a time when our nation, torn apart by four years of disastrous warfare, would try to piece itself back together again. But how did President Johnson interpret the meaning of the Civil War? Well, to Andrew Johnson, the Civil War was a fight that required every tool in the federal arsenal, from the punishing blows of the Union Army to the abolition of African American slavery. But whatever was done during the war was done to win the war. Now that the war was over, President Johnson wanted to put the nation back together just the way it was. I love you just the way you are. This view of Reconstruction won Johnson allies among many conservative Northerners who accepted abolition but had little interest in doing anything further to assist newly freed slaves. It also won him allies among white Southerners who were concerned with maintaining the old racial hierarchies in a post-slavery South and it put him in direct opposition to the radical wing of the Republican Party. The radical Republicans had a much different view of the meaning of the war than Johnson had. Radical Republicans were a small but powerful wing of the Republican Party, represented in Congress by men like Charles Sumner and Thaddeus Stevens. They believed the war had been a revolution and one that was still in progress. The vanguard of this revolution, the federal government, which would take on the responsibility of integrating newly freed slaves into American society. Citizenship, voting rights, a homestead act to help freedmen get new land. All of these goals had to be accomplished by the federal government now, before the Southern states were brought back into the Union. President Johnson would see the radical Republicans as everything from hot-blooded revolutionaries who wanted to Africanize the South to naive do-gooders who could inadvertently set off a race war. 
This feud between Johnson and the Radical Republicans would lead to the unprecedented number of vetoes, which we'll be talking about in this video. So let's begin with veto number one, extension of the Freedmen's Bureau. In March of 1865, President Lincoln signed a bill creating the Freedmen's Bureau, a federal agency which would assist newly freed slaves in the aftermath of the war. It was supposed to operate for a year after the war ended, which would put its expiration date at some time in April 1866. But the radical Republicans decided to get the jump on Johnson by passing an extension bill early. By this point, the Bureau had made incredible progress in the South, providing education to millions of newly freed slaves, helping them get situated with farmland. But it also encountered strong and often violent resistance from locals. The Freedmen's Bureau was dangerous work in a post-slavery South. The extension bill thus included provisions to expand the power of the military to protect the Bureau agents as well as Black Southerners. And that is one of the chief reasons why Andrew Johnson vetoed it. Since taking office, President Johnson had pursued a policy of leniency toward the South. Former officers, high-ranking Confederate Army officials, and ex-Confederate statesmen formed lines outside of the White House seeking pardons and financial assistance after the war. And President Johnson could be counted on to provide. Johnson had been a slaveholder himself. In fact, weeks before the veto, Johnson held a meeting with black leaders at the White House, including Frederick Douglass. I have owned slaves and bought slaves, but I never sold one. For the colored race, my all has been periled. I do not like to be arraigned by those who talk about abstract ideas of liberty, who never periled life, liberty, or property. Johnson was basically saying, since he owned slaves and had to sacrifice them to abolition, he knew better what was best for the South than the delegation. That doesn't make sense. Johnson began his veto with a hollow platitude. I share the strongest desire to secure to the freedmen the full enjoyment of their freedom and property. But... And the rest of the bill is one giant but. Johnson begins by protesting the extension of military power and warns that the rule of law is being usurped by a federal agency which can dispense of justice as it sees fit and is accountable to no one. By placing agents of the Freedmen's Bureau, which was part of the War Department, throughout the South, Congress was extending the arms of the executive branch further into local affairs than the founders had ever imagined. The power that would be thus placed in the hands of the president certainly ought never to be entrusted to any one man. No one man should have all that power. Johnson's concerns about the growing power of the presidency are legitimate especially when considering how powerful that office has since become. But it's also apparent here, and in many of Johnson's other vetoes, that he only seems to worry about tyranny whenever the issue revolves around assisting newly freed slaves. Congress was shocked by Johnson's veto and attempted to override it, but failed. The president was still riding high on a wave of public support since taking office after President Lincoln's tragic death, but his luck would soon change. Veto number two, civil rights legislation. The 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, more or less, and which was added to the Constitution only months before this bill came to the floor, gave no advice on what the status of ex-slaves would be. In order to address this issue, Congress passed a civil rights bill, which would protect the rights of newly freed slaves and facilitate their change of status from slave to free person to citizen. But days after its passage, Johnson sent the bill back to the House with a veto. Four millions have just emerged from slavery into freedom. Can it be reasonably supposed that they possess the requisite qualifications to entitle them to all privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. Johnson's words reflected how many white Americans saw the situation. The end of slavery had brought out new forms of racist politics, with many states, including Northern ones, rushing to pass black codes and other restrictions that would keep newly freedmen segregated or out of their communities altogether. Many states were rushing to pass laws barring blacks from sitting on juries, as well as voting. Johnson did not see any role for the government in settling these issues, 
though that did not stop him from commenting on black suffrage. The bill proposes a discrimination in favor of the Negro, who must of necessity, from his previous unfortunate condition of servitude, be less informed as to the nature and character of our institutions. While Johnson did from time to time acknowledge the difficulty of the situation for newly freed slaves, he brushed off the need for legal intervention by invoking the equalizing power of the free market. The white race and the black race of the South stand now each master of itself. Each has equal power in settling the terms, and if left to the laws that regulate capital and labor, it is confidently believed that they will satisfactorily work out the problem. The idea that black folks' situation would improve simply through the equalizing force of the free market would ultimately not pan out in Johnson's day, as Jim Crow and segregation gradually dominated the South and deprived enterprising black folks of opportunities. These same kinds of arguments would find their voice in the 1960s among opponents of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. It is morally wrong to practice discrimination and it's also economically bad. This type of approach, while I know it's time consuming, it is having its effect. And they continue to comprise a dominant strain of libertarian thought today. Total the 64 total. civil rights bill, do you think a, a employer, a guy runs a shop down in, in, in Texas or anywhere, has a right to say, if you're black, you don't come in my store? Who's going to do it? What idiot? Everybody would, was would in the do, South. What idiot I would saw do the white, If they did, they would be an idiot and they would be out of business. As soon as Johnson's veto message was read in Congress, Republicans called a vote to override it. Days later, by a vote of 33 to 15, Congress overrode the veto. Veto number three, admitting Colorado into the Union. In January of 1867, Congress passed a bill admitting the state of Colorado into the Union. At the time, it was a territory with a population of 27,000 governed by an elected territorial legislature. As with many of the states in the Union, a lot of Coloradans did not want their land to become a haven for newly freed slaves. So the territorial legislature passed an act outlawing black suffrage. But the statehood application required Colorado guarantee black suffrage before it could join the Union. And by the way, in case it wasn't clear, we are talking exclusively male suffrage here. No surprise then that this contradiction formed the basis of Johnson's first gripe with the bill. Forcing black suffrage on a state that didn't want it, according to Johnson, was not in the spirit of democracy. But Johnson had another issue with Colorado statehood. The population of Colorado was not more than 30,000. This number was entirely too small either to assume the responsibilities or to enjoy the privileges of a state. Johnson believed Colorado statehood would give a small number of people disproportionate representation in government. The Constitution requires each state receive two senators and at least one congressional representative. The laws of apportionment at the time held that each state would receive one representative for every 127,000 people. Today, Washington, D.C. is trying to become a state with a smaller population than the number for which Congress people are apportioned. But in Washington, D.C.'s case, it's very close to the apportionment number, and several current U.S. states have even fewer people than D.C. But Colorado had way, way, way fewer people. And for Johnson, giving that small of a population two senators and a congressperson was absurd. For these and other reasons, Johnson vetoed the bill. Congress tried but failed to overturn the veto. Colorado wouldn't become a state until 1875, when railroads would cause waves of migrations westward. The 1880 census puts Colorado's population at nearly 200,000 people. Number four, First Reconstruction Act. By now, the radical Republicans in Congress had become aware that President Johnson was willing to use the veto power in ways no other president had before. This led many to believe that the best way to ensure civil rights for newly freed blacks was through a constitutional amendment. This is because the Constitution does not give the president veto power over an amendment. The 14th Amendment, which guaranteed protection from racial discrimination, passed both houses of Congress in June of 1866, and one by one, states around the country were ratifying the amendment. 
but 10 of the former Confederate states had not yet fully rejoined the Union by this point. And naturally, the question came up. Should a state have to ratify the 14th Amendment before being accepted back into the Union? You can guess by now what side of that question President Johnson landed on. How about new? The radical Republicans were determined to create a new kind of South, one which would embrace a new kind of racial equality. In the post-Civil War period, that by definition meant an intensified military presence. The first Reconstruction Act divided the South into five military zones, each to be overseen by a Northern general who could hold trials and dole out punishments on Southerners who resisted the federal government's Reconstruction efforts outside of normal due process. Such a power has not been wielded by any monarch in England for more than 500 years. It reduces the whole population of the 10 states to the most abject and degrading slavery. No master ever had control so absolute over the slaves as this bill gives to the military officers over both white and colored persons. For long lockdown, basically a slavery. Do you, uh, do you feel enslaved? Uh, I do. It's no surprise that Johnson would invoke a comparison to slavery not only because the slaveholding founders of this country did the same thing in their own time, but also because Johnson had a somewhat rosy image of slavery. During his infamous meeting with Frederick Douglass in 1866, he said, The poor white man was opposed to the slave and his master, for the colored man and his master combined kept him in slavery. When Andrew Johnson was a politician in Tennessee, he had often played the role of patron of the forgotten man, champion of non-slaveholding whites against the combined power of the slave master and the black slave, who kept the white man down. This is where he also derived his suspicion that black suffrage would simply result in ex-slaves voting as their former masters told them. The fact that the Reconstruction Act created a pathway to black voting, but did not address the millions of ex-Confederate voters who still were disenfranchised for their participation in the rebellion, created a lane for further protests. The Negroes have not asked for the privilege of voting. The vast majority of them have no idea what it means. To force the right of suffrage out of the hands of the white people and into the hands of the Negroes is an arbitrary violation of this principle. Despite his veto of the first Reconstruction Act, Congress passed it over his objections. Number five, Tenure of Office Act. At this point, Congress and the president were in open warfare over Reconstruction. Johnson had proved reliable in vetoing all of the radical Republican efforts to assist ex-slaves. Congress had shown itself willing to overturn those vetoes. Andrew Johnson still holds the record for most vetoes overturned. His popularity was waning, and even members of his own cabinet, almost all holdovers from the Lincoln administration, started to turn on him. Worried that Johnson would start firing cabinet officials and replacing them with loyal sycophants, Congress passed the Tenure of Office Act. The act prevented Johnson from firing cabinet members without approval from the Senate. Naturally, Johnson vetoed it. And naturally, the Congress overrode the veto. Fed up with Congress's blatant attempts to tie his hands, Johnson decided to test the new law by firing his Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. In doing so, he kicked off another first in presidential history, the first impeachment. Johnson's Senate impeachment trial lasted 90 days, and in the end, he was saved by a single vote. It was all bullshit. Andrew Johnson completed Lincoln's second term and tried to seek election in his own right. However, his obstinate behavior with the Congress and his inglorious impeachment left Johnson politically dead. He was replaced in 1869 by Ulysses Grant, a Union general and strong supporter of civil rights. He would be one of the few Republicans before the 1960s to win the South, primarily thanks to the black vote. The Grant years would see an increase in black representation in government, as well as a 15th Amendment guaranteeing black males the vote. But it would also be a time of backlash, as the KKK continued to carry out violent attacks against freedmen. Even under an administration supportive of ex-slaves, much of the old slave power in the South was able to reassert itself. The combination of suppression of the black vote and re-enfranchisement of Southern whites would ensure the South remained reliably democratic 
until the 1960s. With 15 of his 29 vetoes overturned by Congress and his ignominious impeachment, Johnson would be remembered as a failed president. But in many ways, his dream of returning the South back to the way it was before the war, particularly in terms of race relations, had become a reality. Thanks everyone for checking out this video today. If you like what you saw, please hit that like button. If you want more content on presidents, click subscribe and consider sending me a donation either on Patreon or on Venmo. Links in the description below. And if you have a question you'd like answered on this channel, please go to Curious Cat. The link is below in the description. And don't forget to check out my Twitch show every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. EST, where I discuss the issues of the day with my co-host, Connor. All right, well, safe living out there, and I'll see y'all next time.